So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Alex Postnikov talking about positive Grassmannians and polyhedral subdivisions. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and it's a big honor for me to speak at this meeting. Uh, so ask for this kind of microphone. I never used it before just to make sure, does everybody hear me okay? Not always. Okay, so if I speak like this, that's fine. Okay, very good. So, I actually, if you have any questions, you can interrupt me at any moment. So in other sections in our talks, I didn't see people asking many questions, but actually I would prefer that you ask me the questions. Okay, so uh, let me start. So the main area uh, of my research is algebraic combinatorics. And uh, I'm sure all of you know what combinatorics is, but just in case, because here we expect broad audience, in case if you don't know, don't know what combinatorics is, uh, so here is my first slide uh, that describes the area of combinatorics. Uh, so combinatorics is uh, the area of mathematics that studies discrete structures, such as permutations, graphs, diagrams of various kinds, and so on. Now, of course, one can think of a lot of different discrete structures, and some of them will be very interesting, some of them are not so interesting, and uh, so how can you tell an interesting combinatorial object from a not so interesting? Of course, this is a personal question, uh, but for me, the criteria is that if an object appears in many different areas of mathematics, if it's connected to many different fields, that's an interesting object. And in fact, many objects that we study came originally from representation theory, from algebraic geometry, from uh, physics, and so on. So from many different fields. And uh, for me also, combinatorics is not some isolated area of math, but it's a way to think about problems in any area of mathematics. So you can think about a problem from uh, geometrically, think about different geometrical shapes, and so on. Or you can think about problem algebraically in terms of equations, or analytically. Or you can think about a problem combinatorially, trying to understand discrete objects that, you know, lie in the core, the combinatorial essence of a particular object. So for example, in physics, well, of course you know there are Feynman diagrams, which are graphs, so that describes interactions between particles. So these are some discrete objects that kind of are in the core of uh, fundamental laws of nature. So in essence, these are combinatorial discrete objects. Okay, so in my first slide, I covered the whole area of combinatorics. Now let me cover my talk. Uh, so as you see here, um, in um, main object, what I'm going to talk about today is the positive Grassmannian. So, positive Grassmannian is a certain geometric object with structure which is similar to a polytope. So, I was trying to draw here a polytope, and you see it has vertices, edges, faces, and so on. It has this combinatorial structure, uh, but it's not exactly a polytope. So, in a polytope, all edges are straight lines, all faces are planes, here, where uh, the edges will be some kind of curved lines. So this is kind of curvy polytope. Uh, and uh, here I put some origins, where these objects came from. So it is related to the notion of uh, totally positive matrices. So these are matrices such that every determinant, so real matrices such that every determinant, every square of every square submatrix is positive. And uh, these objects were initially defined in theories. And the theories were in, uh, by Gantmacher and Crane and Schoenberg. And they appeared in many different areas of the mathematics. And a lot of applications. I'm not going to talk about all these applications, but they are kind of appear in many different things. Uh, then the next big step happened in the 90s uh, in the work of George Lustig who extended this theory of total positivity to reductive Lie groups G and homogeneous spaces G of P. 
So he extended in this general Lee theoretic um, language. Uh, and uh, this theory was motivated by his theory of crystal, uh, of canonical basis. Uh, so it has a lot of links to representation theory. Uh, another source is the theory of cluster algebras by uh, Famin Zelovinsky. So that was developed in a series of papers from 2002 and so on. And a lot of other people worked on cluster algebras. Uh, so these are various sources of this positive Grassmannian. Uh, and uh, so from the point of view of Lustig theory, Grassmannian is a very special case of G mod P. So it's a very special example of his general theory. But as we will see already in this very special example, we can see a lot of interesting structure. So already, so somehow this little example is enough to, or there are a lot of interesting things to study about this. And uh, in 2006, I wrote a paper where I started to study this positive Grassmannian from a combinatorial point of view. So in that paper, I defined uh, various combinatorial objects such as positroids and plebigraphs. So here is a little example of a plebigraph. So plebigraphs means planar bicolored. So these are graphs drawn on the plane, and they had vertices of uh, two colors, black and white, uh, and uh, kind of the calculus of such uh, graphs, they help to understand the structure of the positive Grassmannian. And below I put, so interesting things is, after I define these plebe graphs, they appear in many other different areas of mathematics and physics. So somehow, in very distant areas of mathematics. Uh, so here I put some uh, not all, but some uh, areas in those boundary problems, Schubert calculus, also electrical networks, statistical physics, physics of scatter and amplitudes. So in these very different areas, so at the first slide, you don't, there are no anything common between them, but the same combinatorial structures appear in all these areas. Okay, and now he, here is an example of a plebe graph. So here is a little example. Now, if you want to see more examples, I actually have a this t-shirt uh, that I got from the Center of Quantum Mathematics and Physics at UC Davis. So this summer, there was a summer school there where I gave uh, lectures about this stuff. And you see, so on the boundary, so you see this picture on the boundary, you see this graph with black and white vertices. So that's the plebe graph. Now, if you cannot see my t-shirt very clearly, so let me show you this image. Uh, so that's, that's the graph, that's a plebe graph. So you see, so that's a nice image. Uh, and this image is from the title page of this book uh, by Nima Arkani Hamed et al. called Grassmannian Geometry of Scattering Amplitudes. So most of the authors of this book are physicists, but you can uh, find uh, a few mathematicians among the authors. So a hint that all people, the first name Alexander, and last name ends in, in OV, are mathematicians. Uh, okay, and here is a link to preprint, initial preprint that appeared on archive of this uh, paper. Now I can uh, show, yeah, so one thing, to, uh, so this archive appeared on 21st of December 2012. So by the way, does anybody know anything special about this date? Okay, probably no, nobody of you know, what? Okay, maybe, but also I learned that some people were expecting the end of the world to happen on that date. And, and actually, here is a Wikipedia page about this exact date. So you see, so, so the people were expecting cataclysmic or otherwise transformative events happened on that date. And uh, the reason for that, that that date was the end of the Mayan calendar. Uh, and, uh, okay, and there were some celebrations in many countries in Latin America on that date. Uh, so, fortunately, the world did not end, uh, so we're still here. Um, but let me actually show Mayan calendar. So this is a Mayan calendar. Now, if you went to the opening ceremony, so in the beginning were some media presentations uh, that were showing, you know, various shapes and images created by uh, uh, by people 
uh, from Brasilia. Uh, uh, and uh, here is another image created by another ancient civilization in America. And there are definitely a lot of patterns here. You can see a lot of patterns. But I want you to compare this image, the image that I already showed you before. Oops. And that's the end of the world. It doesn't go, oh, OK. You see, so do you see some similarities between this and this image? So, well, uh, so if you like, this was the world before December 21st, 2012, and this is after December 21st, 2012. And uh, there are a lot of patterns here. So, but this is not only a new version of the Mayan calendar. You can think about this as a new version of Feynman diagrams. Because uh, these graphs help to calculate scattering amplitudes, the fundamental interaction between like fundamental laws of the nature more efficiently than uh, the classical way using Feynman diagrams. And uh, they explain a lot of symmetries about these scattering amplitudes, which are total, total mystery from point of view of uh, uh, Feynman diagrams. And um, uh, well, I don't want to pr repeat, uh, pretend that I know anything about physics. I'm just repeating the words that I, from uh, my physics colleagues. But apparently, that's a promising new approach to scattering amplitudes. Um, well, I just before I continue, I just want to notice something about this image. You see, so can you notice one thing? That's that is drawn inside of a circle, right? Well, that's what you expect from a calendar. The, the events are going to repeat cyclically. Well, and here you also see a circle. Okay, and that is actually very crucial property of this whole story that there is a cyclic symmetry. Uh, so this positive Grassmannian has cyclic symmetry, and if you that's like and it appears everywhere in all objects that we'll discuss today, there are going to be cyclic symmetry. And if you ask me to tell you one, the most important feature of the positive Grassmannian, I think that's the cyclic symmetry. Now, for people who know about Lie theory, this cyclic symmetry is related to Coxeter element in wild groups. Okay, now let me actually define this object. So here is the definition. Well, I hope, so I, I did very low tech presentation. I hope, can, does anybody, can, can you read my handwriting? Okay, so first of all, as I'm sure many, all of you know, Grassmannian is uh, the space of variety or manifold, like pick your favorite name for geometric structure, of uh, k-dimensional subspaces in Rn, in this case, or Cn, but let's talk about real Grassmannian. Uh, and if you want to think about this in a more concrete way, you can think about k, k by n matrices. So by the way, we're going to fix two numbers. k is less than or equal to n. So I'm thinking about matrices, about you know, wide rectangular matrices. Uh, and matrix like this represents the subspace that are represented by matrices is the row space of this matrix. Of course, if you do row operations, if you add one row to another, you get the same subspace. So you have to identify matrices obtained from each other by row operations. And on this Grassmannian, we have Plucker coordinates, which are maximal minors of such matrices. So they're projective coordinates that define up to simultaneous rescaling. So you want to pick the maximal k by k submatrix inside of this k by n matrix, calculate its determinant, and these are maximal minors. They give a coordinate system of, maybe the word coordinates is not very good because there are some algebraic relations between Plucker coordinates but they're called coordinates, and they're labeled by k element subsets. So this uh, capital I is going to be a k element subset of numbers from 1 up to n. So everywhere in my talk, capital I is a k element subset. And now we can define the negative part of the Grassmannian by just requiring that all Plucker coordinates are greater than or equal to 0. So maybe since I told you that they're projective coordinates, more rigorous way to say it, that all of them can be made by rescaling, you can make all of them to be non-negative simultaneously. But I'm abusing notation, I will just write it as all delta i's are greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So now one so let me tell you something about uh, just the whole Grassmannian. So if you talk about this Grassmannian, there was a classical uh, work by Gelfand, Gareski, McPherson, Sergamon uh, in the 87 
there they discuss what is now called mature stratification of the Grassmannian. So it's a subdivision of the Grassmannian by, which is given by this strata given by specifying which Blucher coordinates are equal to zero and which are not equal to zero. And this is an important stratification, and this strata correspond to realizable matroids. You can do it over any field, not necessarily R, you can take complex numbers, so then we will be talking about matroids realizable over your field. Uh, now, these strata are actually not cells. They can have complicated geometrical structure, and in fact, Mnov in 88 proof universality theorem that says that this strata can be as complicated as any algebraic variety. So they can be as single as any algebraic variety. So that means that this is a negative result. So that means that really we cannot hope, yes, of the whole Grassmannian. Not just the body, of the whole Grassmannian. So and on this whole Grassmannian, this strata can be very complicated, as I said, and in fact as complicated as any algebraic variety, as singular as any algebraic variety. So that means that basically we cannot really hope to give a simple combinatorial description of this stratification. Because if you do that, all algebraic geometry will be done. Because you can embed the whole algebraic geometry into this picture. So there is like, this is like a really wild stratification. But if you restrict this stratification on the non-negative part, actually it becomes still, it is still quite non-trivial, but it is manageably not trivial. Then on the non-negative part, you can actually describe the stratification, and here is uh, one result. Uh, well, that uh, on the non-negative now, if you subdivide non-negative Grassmannian by you know, requiring which Plucker coordinates are greater or equal to zero, strictly greater than zero, and which are equal to zero, you get a CW complex. So these strata now are going to be cells. They're going to be homeomorphic to open balls, and uh, we can describe them combinatorially. They correspond to, well, what I call positroids. That's abbreviation for positive matroids. So this set M is the set of all I's such that the Plucker coordinate is strictly positive. You can describe them combinatorially. You can identify then the various combinatorial objects such as permutations and so on. So you get some nice, non-trivial, but very nice manageable object. And, uh, uh, this description relies on parameterization of the Grassmannian given by, in terms of certain graphs. So these kind of graphs that I showed you before, which I called Plebe graphs, or more generally Grassmannian graphs. Uh, so before I tell you what these graphs are, let me uh, mention a few results. So as I just said, the cells themselves are homeomorphic to open ball. So in the same paper, I conjectured that close closures of these cells are homeomorphic to closed balls. So that means that they have trivial topology. I don't want to get full credit for this conjecture because uh, I learned from Famine and Zalavi from Famine that uh, there was a work of Famine Zalavinsky on double grass cells. So these uh, cells that I'm talking about on the grass line, they generalize Famine Zalavinsky double grass cells of type A. So Famine, so it was not explicitly written in the paper, but Famine told me that they, he, they have a conjecture that the closures of these cells are balls, of double dual cells are balls, so this is a natural generalization of famine Zelensky conjecture. And now, since that time, many people try to prove it, but it's uh, actually turned out to be a very non-trivial thing to prove. So basically, conjecture said that the structure, the topology of this space is trivial, but it's very non-trivial proof that the topology is trivial. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and, um, there were a lot of results uh, uh, by, for example, Rich and Willi, uh, uh, Connie Rich and Lauren Williams proved this conjecture modular homology. So there were a lot of results that confirmed this conjecture, but it's still, well, in full generality, it's still open. The most interesting result up to date is a very, it was given in a recent paper by uh, Pavel Galashin, Stephen Karp, and Thomas Lem, who proved that the whole non negative Grassmannian the closure of the top cell is homeomorphic to a closed ball. So that's a very non-trivial, that's the kind of the state of the art result uh, about the topology of this space. And so, by the way, Pavel Galashin, a student, uh, my student, my PhD student, who is going to graduate this year, so please take a notice of his name. Um, okay, now let me tell you what uh, Plebic 
and Grassmannian graphs are. Okay, so these graphs are the graphs G, which are drawn on the plane, or well, inside a, a disk, and uh, they have n boundary vortices, B1, B2, B3. Well, I didn't draw the disk here, but you can uh, imagine that there is a, everything is inside of a disk. There are boundary vortices adjacent to boundary edges. And uh, so basically any planar graph, uh, but uh, in addition, for every vertex, we have a number between zero and degree of that vertex. We call this number the helicity of a vertex, kind of twistedness of a vertex. You can imagine that there's like a little twister sitting in each vertex, and this helicity measures this twistedness, how much it, this vertex twists things. Uh, okay, very simple object. Now, um, we define a perfect orientation. So this graph does not have orientations, or there are no any errors on the edges. But we say that a perfect orientation of graph G is an orientation of all edges of the graph such that at each vertex, the in degree equals to helicity. Now we want to look at all possible ways to put errors on the edges. And for example, if for this vertex you see that helicity is two, that means that there should be exactly two edges entering this vertex, and the remaining two edges should leave the vertex. Okay, so we specify in degrees of these vertices to be just these numbers. And we're looking at all perfect orientations of the graph. Uh, and uh, here is a simple exercise for you, simple lemma, which is very easy to prove. Uh, I, I like to give it like this kind of name, helicity conservation law. Uh, okay, so that says that if you make any two different perfect orientations of the same graph, and look on the boundary edges and see which of these boundary edges are oriented in and which are oriented out, well, you might get different subsets of boundary edges, but they will always be the same number, the same number k of boundary edges which are oriented in. It's not very hard to prove. Uh, okay, now we can define the set i, so o will be an orientation, a like this, a perfect orientation, and I of O will be the subset of the boundary edges which are oriented in. And now you take, define M of the graph, so to be the set of all I of O for all perfect orientations of graphs. You look at all possible orientations and just look at the, see how these orientations behave on the boundary, and you get some collection of K element subsets of numbers from up to N. Uh, and claim is that this set is always a positroid, and any positroid, so that's going to be exactly the set of minors that can be made strictly positive, uh, and uh, every positroid has this form. So it means that for any graph that has at least one perfect orientation, if this set is non-empty, you get certain cell in the Grassmannian. Well, of course, this is not exactly one-to-one -one correspondence for a very simple reason, that if you fix N and K, there will be finitely many cells, uh, but you can think of infinitely many, there are infinitely many possible graphs, you know, with n boundary vertices, for given n and k will be infinitely many. So it's definitely not one-to-one -one correspondence, but any positroid, any cell can be represented by a graph in this way. Okay. Another definition, so actually I'm going to give you a bunch of definitions, and then I'll formulate the result. So another definition is uh, that a strand, uh, alpha, is a directed walk in a graph from one boundary vertex to another boundary vertex, or a closed walk, whose directions has nothing to do with errors that are in a perfect orientation. Now we are looking at undirected graph, but we are looking at certain directed walks there, uh, such that at each vertex, uh, the walk turns exactly, well, helicity is the number of steps, number you need to uh, turn exactly h of v steps clockwise. So you think about this helicity, you know, do you know, use GPS, so then you use GPS, then you enter rotary, GPS say take the second exit. Okay, so these helicities are the exits that we need to take at each vertex. Uh, and uh, so for example, so here is an example, so this is example of a plebe graph, which is a special case uh, of uh, the previous graph, so all vertices are trivalent, and we have two possible helicity, one and two. So if black vertices are vertices of helicity one, white vertices are vertices of helicity two. And we have the rules of the road. If you enter a black vertex, you turn left. 
if you enter white vertex, you turn right. So for example, if you start at B1, you go here, it's black, you turn left, then it's here white, you turn right, left. Okay, and if you start at B7, you turn left, right, 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 until you reach some other boundary variables. These are, uh, these are these uh, works. For, so for example, if you go back to this picture, so where is this? Yeah, not this, but this. So you see all these you know, strands, so this cover, it works are exactly the strands that I'm talking about. Okay, so, Okay, another definition. They say that the graph is reduced if it has no closed trends, if these trends cannot self-intersect, and if we don't have what I call bad double crossings. Two, two different strands cannot have uh, two points where they intersect such that both of these strands go from first point to the second. So we do allow good double crossing, where one strand goes from V to U and the other goes from U to V, that's okay, but they cannot go in the same direction and have two common points. Okay, so, so in a sense, this notion is similar to the notion of reduced decompositions in a, in a wild group of elements of wild groups. Uh, and now we have a, another definition, strength permutation. That's permutation of size n that sends i to j if the strand that starts at i ends at j. So for example, in this case, so we have a strand from B1 to B3, so the permutation will send 1 to 3, and it will send 7 to 5, okay? So that's strand permutation. Okay, so I'm almost done with definitions, but let me give you another definition. Uh, we say that the graph is complete graph of, of type Kn if its strand permutation sends i to i plus k modular n. So, for example, a single black vertex is a graph, complete graph of type 1, 3. Single white vertex is a complete graph of type 2, 3. So this square with white, black, black, white vertices has type 2. You can easily check that. Okay, so how do I click? Okay, so another definition. Sorry, a lot of definitions, but I'm almost done. Uh, so we say that the refinement ordering of Grassmannian graphs is the ordering generated by the following operation. Replace a vertex of degree D and helicity H by a complete Grassmannian graph of type HD. So here are example. If you have a single vertex of helicity 1, you can kind of, of and degree 4, you can kind of split it into two trivalent black vertices, like this and like this. So. These are, these are the covering relations between graphs. Or if you similarly have a single vertex of degree uh, 4 and helicity 3, you can split it into two white vertices and two black, black vertices. And if helicity equals to 2, you can split it into four vertices, white, black, black, white, or black, white, white, black. Okay. And if you have a vertex like this and a bigger graph, you can do this operation. So, so these are refinements. Uh, operations. So that defines certain partial order on Grassmannian graphs. And uh, for example, if, uh, so in this partial order, Plebe graphs are minimal elements, the graphs that cannot be refined further. So if you have travel and vertex, you cannot split it to anything. But if you have a vertex of uh, the four edges, you can split it either into a pair of trivalents or three uh, travel and vertices, like I showed you before. And uh, we also say that two Plebex graphs are connected by the moves if they're covered by the same graph. So that's exactly like on this picture. Uh, so these two graphs are connected by the move because they are covered by the same graph. So, so basically we have three types of moves. So you can, uh, so if in your graph, so the, you can, uh, should think about this as a little piece of some bigger graph. So if in your Graph, you have a pair of black vertices connected by an edge. You can kind of contract this edge and uncontract it in a different way. And you can do the same thing with a pair of white vertices. Uh, and you can also have a more non-trivial move that they call square move. Uh, if you have a square with white, black, black, white vertices, you can switch the colors. So these are just three moves that we're allowed to do. And now I'm ready to formulate one theorem. Theorem. Two 
reduce Grassmannian graphs G and G prime, for two reduced uh, Grassmannian graphs G and G prime, they follow an equivalent. They correspond to the same positroid. They correspond to the same cell. If and only if, they have the same strength permutation. Uh, if and only if one graph is refinement equivalent to the other graph. That means that you can get from one graph to another by a sequence of refinements and unrefinements and coarsenings. Now, if both of these graphs are plebic, if they are already minimal element in the elements in the refinement order, this happens if and only if G is move equivalent to G prime. You can get from one graph to the other graph by performing moves of these three types that I showed you before. Okay. Now, so this, uh, sorry, so this is a combinatorial theorem, but below, underneath this combinatorial theorem, there is some geometric structure. And this geometric structure actually says that the graphs give you parameterizations of these, uh, reduced graph parameterize these Grassmannian uh, cells in the non-negative Grassmannian. Uh, so in a sense, each reduced graph represents a way to glue a positroid cell out of little Grassmannians associated with vertices. So for example, here we have this square with uh, black, white, white, black vertex. So this graph parameterizes the Grassmannian, and you have to think about this as a, you have for each vertex, you have little Grassmannians. For black, you have Grassmannian 1, 3, and for white vertex, you have Grassmannian 2, 3. And of course, both of these Grassmannians are just projective planes. So you kind of glue these projective planes along the edges of this graph, and you get the Grassmannian 2, 4. Now, it's a bit vague statement. More precise statement is given in the paper. Uh, so maybe, maybe let me try to make it a little bit more precise. So by glue, I mean, I mean the following. So you need to take the product of these projective planes. So you have a product of four projective planes. And uh, you need to take the quotient of this space uh, modular torus. So for each H, you have a torus. You have to take a quotient modular four-dimensional torus. And then you get an object which is birationally equivalent to the Grassmannian. And there is explicit birational isomorphism uh, between these gluings of projective planes and the Grassmannian. And, uh, and uh, on the positive parts, this is going to be just exactly a bijection. So in general, it's certain birational isomorphism. It might have poles. But uh, on the positive part, that's just give a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in particular, you can parameterize the Grassmannian by these products of these projective planes. OK. And no, no, so there are explicit formulas how to do that. And the easiest way to do it, there are gluing formulas given in terms of Plucker coordinates. Uh, and again, you can find all details in the paper. Uh, but let me just briefly tell you, uh, just to show that this gluing is very simple. So in terms of the Plucker coordinates, so this delta i is the Plucker coordinates in the big Grassmannian, GRKN. And each of these Plucker coordinates is given by the sum over perfect orientations with the, so where a subset i corresponds to the boundary edges. So we fix the behavior on the boundary. We say which edges, boundary edges are oriented in and which are oriented out. And otherwise, you are free to pick your perfect orientations. You take a sum of all these perfect orientations. And for each perfect orientation, you take the product of Plucker coordinates in little Grassmannians that correspond to the vertices. So you look at each vertex and see which edges are oriented towards this vertex. Like, look at the adjacent edges to the vertex, and look at which of them are oriented towards the vertex and which are oriented away from the vertex, and you take the corresponding subset, and that's the subset that labels the Plucker coordinates in a little grass mine. So there is a simple, simple formulas. And uh, in case of playback graphs, you can also reformulate it in, in terms of counts in matchings. So it's sum of all matchings, uh, there is equivalent reformulation. Okay. So simple formulas, uh, but that helps so to do all these machinery and proof results that I mentioned before. Uh, okay, now you can think of it so, but here we kind of informally think of this by as the gluings of Grassmannians, little Grassmannians, and this is kind of ana analogous to the way how you glue polytops out of little, out of simplices. So you can, for example, can glue, glue little a lot of triangles to make an angon. So we get these polyhedral subdivisions so of angons or triangulations and so on. And this is kind of gluing procedure. It's kind of similar. In fact, it's not just similar. It's exactly equivalent to special case of gluing polytopes. So let me tell you. So the framework for that is the theory 
of fiber polytopes by Belair and Stumfels. Uh, so the general setup for the theory of fiber polytopes is a projection. So you have one polytope P, and you project it, like a linear projection, to another polytope Q. And uh, then uh, uh, we are talking about something which is called, in this theory, pi-induced subdivision. So, skipping some technical details, the pi-induced subdivision is a polyhedral subdivision of the image of Q by projections of some faces of P. And uh, then uh, there is a Bowers poset. It's the poset of all pi-induced subdivisions ordered by refinement. And in general, there are some non-trivial conjectures. There's something called generalized Bowers problem about this po Bowers poset that says that where, when the topology of this poset is trivial, uh, is uh, homeomorphic to a ball. In some cases it is, it is trivial, in some cases it's not trivial. So there are a lot of research done by many people, I think by uh, Gunther Ziegler worked on this, uh, and other people worked on this generalized Bowers problem, and there are fluid connectivity problem, another related problem. So that's a big topic of research. There are a lot of open problems here. Uh, but let me mention two special cases. Then people looked at this uh, more closely at this problem. So one case, if P is a simplex. If P is a simplex, then you can get any polytope by projection of a simplex. So in this case, we are talking about triangulations, usual triangulations of polytopes, polyhedral subdivisions, and so on. And the fiber polytope in this case is a so-called secondary polytope of Gilfan, Kapranov, and Zlavinsky. It's related to discriminants, their theory of discriminants. So that's one case when this setup was studied. So another case that was studied a lot is that then P is a cube, n-dimensional hypercube. Projections of hypercubes are from a special class of polytopes called zonotopes. And in this case, we're talking about zonotopal tilings, uh, extensions of oriented matroids. Again, there was a lot of research about this, and uh, Gunther is an expert in this area. Uh, now, for us, we need another case, which is kind of related both to these two special cases. We need to do this setup, then P is a, what is called hypersimplex. So hypersimplex is a section of the hypercube. You take the n-dimensional hypercube, so x i are between 0 and 1, and you cut it by the hyperplane, by the affine hyperplane, sum of all coordinates equals to k. So that is, if k equals to 1, that's a usual simplex. Uh, and it's a section of the hypercube. So it is related to both of these previously studied examples. And the uh, theorem here is that the poset of reduced Grassmannian graphs of type Kn is isomorphic to the Bowers poset uh, for projections of the hypercube into n-gon. So we need to take project. So there are, well, this hypersimplex, for example, here, for 2, 4, this hypersimplex is the octahedron drawn here. It has six vertices. In general, it has n choose k vertices. And among these n choose k vertices, there are uh, n special vertices uh, given as follows. You take a bunch of ones, like k ones, followed by n minus k zeros, and you take all cyclic shifts of these. Uh, uh, so you have 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on. So you have these n vertices, and you want to project uh, your hypersimplex such that these vertices project into vertices of a convex and gone. And for these projections, uh, the bow is posted is exactly equivalent to this uh, Grassmannian graph that I was talking about before. So, for example, in this example, you think about these projections of the octahedron into a square, and there are going to be two uh, subdivisions finest subdivisions, one is given by the upper half of the boundary, and the other subdivision is given by projections of the lower half of the boundary. And these two cases are exactly correspond to these two black -black graphs, the white, black, black, white, or black, white, white, black, vertices that permit rise Grassmannian 2, 4. Okay. Another, let me mention another, uh, yes? So it's so the hypersimplex is also 
the moment polytop of the Grassmannian, and that's in this uh, paper of Gelfand, uh, uh, well, that, uh, and others that I mentioned before, that plays a crucial role. So, uh, to, so here, we found another relationship between hypersimplex and, uh, and the positive geometry of the Grassmannian. So that's kind of another relationship. But this, yeah, but this uh, relationship with the hypersimplex in Grassmannian was studied a lot before in the uh, context of uh, moment map. Uh, okay, so here's another, let me briefly mention another related result. Okay, that's uh, from uh, my forthcoming uh, uh, ongoing project with uh, Thomas Lamb called Membrane and Discrete Plateau Problem. So since we are in the ICM, I should mention that the first Fields Medal was awarded to Jesse Douglas for solving plateau problem about minimal surfaces with uh, given boundary. So you can think about, well, what this problem is, that's, that's the problem. You can think about soap bubbles. You have uh, some frame, you know, some wire, like closed frame, in a space and you want to put a surface, like a uh, uh, soap uh, film, and the uh, soap has a tendency to take the minimal area, so that's the surface of minimal area. And this uh, plateau problem is actually a problem about the existence of such surface, and it's a very non-trivial problem, and so it's false field metal was given by the solution of this problem. Now, in our case, we need to talk about discrete version of this problem. So what's the discrete version? Uh, now let me define a loop. So instead of this blue uh, wire, uh, we are going to also talk about some closed curve in Rn. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so here is the loop. Closed curve in Rn, but now it should be a piecewise linear curve uh, in Rn which is made out of line segments A, B, such that both A and B are integers, and the difference A, A minus B is, has the form E, I minus E, J, difference of two coordinate vectors. Or it's the roots of type A root systems. So you use these roots to kind of make a closed curve, and the membrane with a given boundary loop is a two-dimensional surface in Rn uh, with boundary L, which is made out of little triangles, A, B, C, such that, again, A, B, C, are integer points, and all edges of this triangle again have the form of the roots, EI minus EJ. So that's a membrane. And uh, finally, minimal membrane. A minimal membrane is a surface of this form which is, has minimal possible area among all membranes they've given boundary. So now here is the result. So for given permutations, we can make a loop uh, like this, with segments that goes through points A1, A2, and so on, such that difference of AI minus A, AI plus 1 minus AI is EWI minus EI, that is certain loop. And claim is that reduced Plebe graphs, this trend permutation W, I in bijection with minimal membranes with given boundary loops. So this object that I was talking about, these objects, these Plebe graphs, what they have drawn here are actually minimal, you can think about them as minimal surfaces uh, in Rn. And I think I'm almost done. Uh, I have two minutes, I don't really have time for questions, but let me show the last slide, which is the most important slide, that gives a list of papers. So the stuff that I discussed today is covered in these papers. So that's uh, the paper that I mentioned, uh, where I define these baby graphs and so on. Then they have a paper with David Spire and Lauren Williams where we describe this positive grass binding in terms of toric geometry. Then there was a paper of my former student, Suha Oh, that he, he had given a combinatorial and a description of the uh, uh, positroids. Then we have a paper with uh, Oh, Suha Oh, and David Spire where we identified. Um, these uh, playback graphs, the weakly separated sets. I didn't tell you about weakly separated sets, but there was a work of uh, Leclerc Zelovinsky, uh, which is a kind of one of the motivation of the theory of cluster algebras. So in this uh, paper, we related these two areas. Then that's the book about scheduling amplitudes. Then there is a recent paper by uh, Pavel Galashin, uh, who proved that uh, playback graphs are sections of the natopal tilings of three-dimensional zone hopes. Then that's the paper of Galashian Carpen Lamb that I mentioned, where they proved that the grass is a ball, and here's a uh, 
paper in preparation with Thomas Lamb. But, and of course, there are works of many other people, Lustig, of course, Rich, Pominza Levinsky, Cluster Algebra, Scott, Cartier Williams, they are related it to uh, PASEP model, Knudsen, Laman, Spire, they are related it to Schubert calculus, Kadama Williams, who related this to uh, solitons, Galashin Pedavsky, who related this to Ising model, recent paper, I should mention, recent paper of Rich and Williams, who related these objects to Newton Oconcov bodies. So, and a lot of other papers. And I think I can uh, finish here. Any uh, questions at all for the, on the talk? Uh -huh. Do you wanna... So this projection of the hypersimplex to, you have a projection to the plane, is this an obvious, very natural projection or it doesn't seem obvious to me? This is the projection of a hypersimplex is given by, a, again, matrix, a totally positive matrix. That's a cyclic, in general, it's a, projection, a cyclic projection. So as you define cyclic polytopes, you kind of take a given, for example, by moment curve. So that's a very natural from this point of view. I didn't. Yeah. OK, are there any other uh, quick questions? Or if not, let's uh, thank Alex again. Thank you.